which is unfortunately it's sold out right now. Oh yeah. Yeah, it sold out last year, and I have to press them more. But uh... all right, let's start at the start, Jason. Extremity retained. Things we're going to have a discussion yeah. about death metal. Thirty years on from nineteen ninety one to now, I suppose if we were being very pedantic and Germanic about it, we might realize that this is. 31 years because you have your one year inclusive or something don't you but well let's not quibble about that but <laughs> so we discussed this uh we had a kind of table discussion at some festival years and years ago before you wrote this book but can you tell us what was the sort of notes from the underground what was the reasons for kind of making doing the book well at the time i started i don't know it was start i started in 2011 actually and uh oh yeah and, you know, it was like right about that time, it was about the, the 20 year point from 1990, 91. And, uh, you know, I started to see, you know, I was touring a lot with my band at the time and um, end up backstage or on tour with people. And then you, you start hearing these stories going around backstage about old tours, about old studio experiences, about um, the way things used to be, sometimes waxing nostalgic, sometimes like you know, I don't know, mythologizing or whatever about things. And, and, you know, I looked at just from a perspective, I just thought, you know, why these are like great stories. Like, you know, and I thought about what had been written already. And for death metal, there was, uh, you know, Albert Mudrin's book, Choosing Death. And there was, you know, a handful of other kind of like loosely related texts and some academic ones. And, and I just thought it would be fun to have like a book that was just uh, like an oral history. You know, there's just like a collection of stories and like, uh, you know, reminiscences and uh, and kind of to give to paint a kind of like picture of the history in in the words of those who lived through it and were present at the creation and experienced it and all that sort of thing. So I just uh, you know, since we were touring a lot, it, it took advantage of the time and in uh, you know, especially at festivals, as you know, you can kind of backstage and you're sitting there yeah. at a table having a beer maybe playing later that night or the next day and look around and there's like a who's who of the metal scene usually yeah, like yeah. sitting around there so I was like so I just you know I got a digital recorder and over like three years or two or three years I just started like compiling these stories and uh, slowly put them together for the book and then you know once I had all the stories I kind of like uh you know, you see these narratives start to come up so you can kind of like make some kind of loose chapters out of it, you know, based on origin stories or studio stories or tour stories. And so I just kind of went with that. And yeah, it was, it was actually came out in 2014. So it's going through a couple prints, print runs. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's out of print right now, unfortunately, but yeah, I'm trying to get back soon. Yeah, I mean, I think that's how we started talking about this was we kind of ended up uh, at the same, I think, you know, sometimes you get paired for weekends with a band that you don't know and you end up being in the same shuttle bus, same stage, same time, and you end up hanging out with them um, over like a weekend or two. And I think that's how we ended up starting to talk about this because me and our bass player were discussing um, kind of like street violence in the old Irish death metal scene or something of 19. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it, of course, you don't have to be, be playing death metal to have those experience or have lived those experiences and have something to contribute. So, yeah, yeah, I think it was like um, the one where we met was like one of those metal fests. I don't know if you were the Rock the Nation then. Um, I'm not. Ooh. I don't think so. But, uh, it was Rock the Nation that it got us on, and we did like five, five shows and like one in each country. That was like some. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we did. We did kind of like the two weekends or something, you know, um, yeah. but sometimes you get, yeah, you kind of get stuck in the same little port or cabin or whatever, you know. Yep. But, but um, so the, the kind of premise of what we're d discussing here was um, it's really kind of 30 years since I suppose you could consider the heyday of death metal. I mean, I would agree with that. I was 15 or 16 then and it was just like at the apex of um, it was just hitting its apex right when I was about the most excited I could possibly be as a, you know, teenager, just pre-adult, just perfectly in that adolescent moment where you'd gone past Metallic and Slayer and all of a sudden you'd found Morbid Angel and Death and Deicide. 
and um, but you uh, the, you also got to see those bands in their prime and in their pump, not now when they're in their mid fifties or whatever. Some of them still great, but to see Morbid Angel in 1991 was something else, I think, really, because that was right when they were hitting that right at the top. Like the way, you know, when you've spoken to somebody who said, oh, you should have seen Motorhead in 83 or yeah, <laughs> in 80 or whatever. And you're like, ah, yeah, OK. But that well, was the moment where it was perfectly placed in time. And Ireland was just starting to get, there was a couple of promoters who were bringing over death metal bands and before they all moved into rave because ecstasy culture kind of killed death metal in Ireland in 92. But for, for a while, between 89, 90 and 92, I mean, Morgoth, Carcass, Death, Morbid Angel, the gigs were just stay aside, just sort of endless. And it was just perfectly placed for a window of about 20 months. Um, yeah. But what we're gonna like try and have a look at is that moment, like you were in Maryland then, right? Yeah. And so- Washington DC, Washington, DC Baltimore kind of, metropolitan area and you must have seen then some of the same bands obviously coming through at the same time yeah i saw morbid angel in 91 too with uh entombed and unleashed opening up yeah we got unleashed but we didn't get entombed and entombed i think i don't think it was lg singing though i think it might have been the, the nirvana 2002 guy or var remember his name okay yeah yeah <laughs> I can't be sure because I was a little out of it at the time. And, uh, yeah. But it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, this venue in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. called the Bayou, where a lot of those shows went and held about maybe 600 people. And it was, yeah. you know, they would sell out. It was fantastic, you know. But does it, does it now seem really strange to think, like, that that was actually 30 years ago? Because often I... I remember getting into extreme, more extreme stuff in 87, 88, let's say, and Kill 'em All seemed like it was ancient and it was 83 and it was 87 or 88, you know, um, and it seemed yeah. like a long time ago. But like now, of course, um, 1970 is closer to Injustice for All than we are. Yeah, it's crazy. It's period <laughs> I think that, you know, your relationship with time as you grow older, of course, shifts and changes because the more experience you get behind you, the more, it, you know, it, the less things seem new and the more things get ordinary, I think. And, and of course, when you've only been alive for like 16 years on the planet, yeah. when you look back, it's something from the perspective of 1990 to 1974 that's ancient history, you know, cause you can't, cause it's before you were born. Yeah. It's like, this, you know, that's like, but to think about now, like 16 years ago is, you know, 2004 yeah. or sorry, 2005. And it's like, it, it's still a lifetime ago, but you don't have that same, the same perspective. The perspective is totally different because you know, I suppose, just, to ha I suppose to have that perspective, I suppose that to, to have that perspective, we'd have to be half as old as we are, I suppose. <laughs> You'd have to be 22, I suppose, or 21 or something. And that's when you talk to somebody who's 19 or 20 now, and then you realize, oh, like, okay, so in 2010, you were nine years old or something. And, you know, when you're yeah. you play with some young guys, you realize, oh, right, okay. Yeah, so I was nine in 1980, <laughs> three or four or something like that, you know? I suppose yeah. that's that's true that's the length of time is is relative to how many years you've spent on the planet but it still seems crazy that that's called it the golden age of death metal um it was, I did a podcast yeah, sure. about this like 20 podcasts ago i mean of course there's still great death metal bands now but the golden age is 30 years ago it seems to be such a young man's game when you think about it. all those bands were raging and they were all in their early to mid 20s do you think it's still possible to make death metal that vital when you you know approach you're hitting the 50 mark <laughs> maybe for us or for you know for those who us who play death metal or, or whatever kind of you know music we're doing it's if it's vital for you that's all that matters um but i think the music you, we also have to remember this, this music is always i think for it's all about for it's really tied up in youth and adolescence and it's it, it's it's uh it's music for those who are getting it now that it's their time yeah you know that's this is something alex webster told said to me actually when i was talking to him for the book he said you know this always have to remember it doesn't matter like 
our perspective is like what it is, but carrying the flag forward, like kids getting in, into it today, you know, it's new to them. It's fresh to their ears, you know, and it's like, and they're going to take it and do what, what they will with it. And it's, it's really cool to see how some, some of the younger bands are, you know, kind of like looking back and, and respect, you know, showing respect and like channeling like a lot of the vibe and sounds from that golden era. Yeah. And it's still very much alive more than ever today. So it's, that's really cool to see. I mean, I have some notes here. We're going to do some sort of, I suppose, um, favorite things or three things of this, that, and the other. But even when I was just today flicking through the vinyls and just doing a little bit of um, nerding out on the year 1991, I mean, the list of albums that come out mm. that year is, it's outrageous. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just even here on the page, I've got From Beyond, Massacre, Ten Commandments, Malevolent Creation, Soulside, Journey, Grave, Into the Grave, Human, Blessed Are the Sick, Clandestine, Dismember Like an Overflowing Stream, Mental yeah. Funeral, Where No Life Dwells, Dawn of Possession, War yeah, Master, Orchard <laughs> of Birth, Morgoth Cursed, Asphyx, and that's before we even get to like Demolich, Pertinence, Gorguts, Massacre, even Sarcophago weighed in. You know, it's just, the list is... <laughs> It's just outrageous looking back on it, you know? I mean, there's yeah. at least 50 records there that, um, you know, would have belt, you know, bent my fucking brain back in 1991, trying to get hold of, waiting for them to come into the shop and, oh God, fucking Shadows of the Past sentence to come in <laughs> um, or whatever, you know? But it is insane. It's insane. Yeah, I mean, every weekend you could go to the shop and <clears throat> there was something new. And it was just such a vibrant time, man, because like, even all those albums you named are so unique in their own sound. Yeah. In their own like expression and voice of like what they were doing. You know, I mean, I guess it wasn't till like the second kind of wave came when you started getting more of the, you know, the similarities and the kind of clones and stuff. But that, <clears throat> I think that's why 1991 is a key year because that just the, that little, that list there alone, you know, just the sheer diversity among every release that was coming up. Know. Yeah, I mean, and for me, like as a kid who was always <clears throat> had half an eye on, like in 1989, 1990 tape trading, I had already got like Master's Hammer, Rotten Christ, Satanus Tedium, um, and there were rumblings of Beherit, and I was always drawn more to that nasty kind of evil stuff, but the rumblings of black metal were in the background. But by 92, it was about to like clobber a lot of death metal on the head for me, in a way, not meant in a way that death metal became two shorts on MTV songs about the environment. But by 91, it was still vital, but almost by the end of 92, my listening taste had shifted. Black metal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, well, say death metal in 91 had become to be MTVized and a bit, oh, I didn't <clears> like <throat> the whole Enviro Eco stuff. And I wanted my evil back in death metal. So when black metal came along, especially it was already rumbling away in 19, 1990, 1991. Mm. And I'd started to divide my loyalty between the two. But by 92, um, I really stepped more into the black metal thing. But 91 is like the perfect moment for it, for death metal. Yeah. But the rumblings of black metal were kind of, they were in the distance. They were moving <laughs> across the horizon. But, mm. but, um, I don't know if that was the same for you, but the list of these records is kind of um, outrageous. I mean, Death Forever magazine, I don't know, they had a top 30 or top 100, of course, or 100 and something. And they had From Beyond listed as the best, their best journalists, you know, pooled record of 1991. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's wrong, but I mean, I, I guess, you know, because the, the issue with that record for me is it took so long to come out. I mean, if it, it came out when it should have, yeah. like in 87 or, you know, when that prop, that lineup was set. Yeah. But as we know, like they had a little detour. Some of the guys had a detour with death, you know, yeah. a very awesome one. Yeah. And by the time, you know, they got Cam, I guess, and got around to recording that record, which is still killer and awesome. But I kind of like, even when it came out, I kind of uh, didn't give it the, maybe the time I should have or whatever, because I felt like, ah, this is kind of like death light in a sense. This is like, this kind of reminds me a lot of the stuff that was happening. The death is already ground, they've already tread and stuff. And yeah, I love Cam Lee's vocals. 
and saw immediately how influential they were for like Barney and yeah, and but um, but such, yeah, it's such a gap between the Chamber of Ages demo and then when From Beyond came out. I mean, those that's for almost five years. Exactly. Exactly. So like yeah. if, if if From Beyond had been in 88, 89, you know, it probably would have set the stage for them to be even bigger. But I did see them that year with Immolation and Morgoth in Dublin. I don't know. Did you see them at the time? Um, no. I didn't see. I don't know if that tour came through our area, but I, I know that, that that European tour I've seen. There's actually, I think, a video on YouTube from the Dublin show. Oh, yeah? Massacre. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. It was Devastation were supposed to be on it, uh, Texas Devastation, I think, um, and they were replaced by Immolation. Um, and at the time in 1991, when that show came through, uh, we I, I don't think we'd ever seen a band playing as fast as Immolation for Dawn of Possession. It was outrageous to see bands playing, like literally, you know, the, that fast. We, we'd yeah. seen some things, but not quite that brutal. <laughs> yeah. I remember, like, uh, like, did you see the the tour there where uh, with Death Play without Chuck? I think it was, or yeah, yeah, I, I saw that with Creator. Was, all right. Yeah, was that ninety nine as well. That's nineteen ninety. It's Coma Souls. Right, right. Um, it was weird. It was a huge. It was a huge crowd in Dublin. It was like over a thousand people, and Death came out with a guy called Walter Thrashler or something on guitar. Yeah, from, from Devils. Yeah, he was in Rotting Corpse as well. Uh, maybe, maybe it's from Devastation. I'm not sure. And then some dude the Rody of Devastation sang for them, maybe. Yeah, and he he didn't have a death metal voice really. Um, uh, and then the other two, and they just played their way through the first album mainly, and then just persi- and just spent most of the time insulting Chuck for not being there and stuff. Yeah, it was a rough time. Mm. So let's but. do this. Um, Let's have a, like, what's your, okay, so that, if we're going to do this, like, um, nerdy stuff, like nerdy best of, which really appeals to me because I'm a super um, list, list nerd, um, what is the, what's the, what's in your opinion the best death metal album then of 1991? Um, well, I kind of, you know, being an East Coast, you know, in the U.S., for me, I was really attracted to the brutal stuff. Okay. I was on a constant quest to find the, the the more brutal kind of thing, and I really gravitated towards the New York death metal stuff. I was really into uh, Suffocation, Baphomet, Upstate, and that kind of stuff, and and the other bands in New York like Pyrexia, and yeah, yeah, that scene was like really the core of like just this crushing, pummeling death metal. So me, for me, Effigy the Forgotten would probably be for that year. Although I was a huge Boltor fan as well, so War Master, and and you, you mentioned, and as far as a surprise release that is also pretty close is is Carcass Necroticism. Yeah, I, I didn't love, I didn't actually mention that. Uh, that the, is um, <laughs> that is like so it's such a leap and like you know songwriting and production everything. From, I love symphonies as well. You know, it's transgressive, like ugly. It's perfect. So it just. If you I was had, not expecting the crowds in any way. So. Yeah. so if you had three, those are those suffocation carcass and yeah, but I mean, there's like you said, I, off the top of my head, I would I would lean towards those. But there's so many great releases that year; it's just hard to really narrow it down. But but I think the one I probably listened to the most was Effigy the Forgotten. <laughs> it's that's strange because I remember the the suffocation. Put you to birth, I think yeah. put you to birth, yeah. These are the see. This is the kind of death metal that kind of left me a little bit on the shore, in the yeah. sense that I had the suffocation demo reincremated, I think, and then I yeah. bought Human Waste EP when I came out, and I wasn't really sure what to think of it, but I always preferred Immolation and Incantation. Like I wanted mm-hmm. some Satan and some nails right. and studs, and so the the, 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 the choppy mm-hmm. stuff never really. I, it never like suffocation wouldn't even be in my top. 25 of that year i i just it just i don't get it at all i get what it is to people but i don't it just never resonated with me at all i think that's that's pretty much the first you know great divide if you will in death metal maybe yeah because you started to see this development between on one hand like perfectionism and refinement you know this kind of like more sound productions and things are getting really like tight and and uh you know, accentuating the brutal stuff, you know, and 
On the other hand, there was this sort of like uh, push towards ugliness and rawness in like yeah. the autopsy movement, you know, well, and it, that's that's immolation and incantation. So you had this. I think that's something that still exists today. It's like this kind of like those who you know who what kind of speaks what kind of death metal speaks to you. It's usually like on the, that trajectory. Well, this you know, is my favorite. Of, this is my favorite of that year. That, that, well, there, there you go. I mean, that's, that's you know, to speak of an album that I had to come back to, and I appreciate it now, it's that one. Yeah. Because, you know, in my, you know, in my narrow vision back then, I started gravitating, and I love those more sound productions. So when I heard Mental Funeral, it just didn't have the, you know, the balls or the, you know, it yeah. wasn't crushing. It's it was just a different kind of heaviness. It was darker. And it, for whatever reason in my life, it, you know, it didn't, I wasn't gravitating towards that. It's a really all. interesting. It's a really interesting record. I, I should have. I should have explained that for people that who may be listening to this without visuals. Uh, yeah, that was Mental Funeral is my top. Um, just about, but it's my top. Um, but the thing about Mental Funeral is that I loved Saint Vitus and Candlemas and Pentagram. Mm. So I was a big Doom head as well. So instantly these. Doom riffs just resonated really strongly with me, but it's such an ugly record, and it's yeah. dark. And and the fact that if you if you listen to it now, like the guitars barely have any distortion on them, it's really strange. Like you, I actually listened to that record today in preparation for this because I wanted to get back and listen to some of those I hadn't really, you know, and, and I really appreciate it a lot more now. Yeah, it's weird. Sure. Like it's so clean with a really front loaded drum sound, but the guitar tone is quite. Um, it's quite small for a death metal record from 1991, considering, you know. Yeah, to me, it's like it's got a, it has those elements of metal and, and doom as well as punk, you know, and it kind of, it's just like the anti Morris sound kind of of the time, you know, this kind of other, it just shows you how, you know, death metal was moving in these different directions, which became their own subgenres after a while. Yeah. yeah. And it was kind of almost for me, uh, like a reaction to the Cannibal Corpse suffocation style, which I didn't really like. I liked yeah. the fact that I, I, I guess I also got a kind of thrill from the fact that I knew death metal people who hated it because I just thought <laughs> it was too fucking too slow and stuff. Yeah. And but it was it was the trouble riffs that just got me the Sabbathy trouble riffs. But again, it's got some super clean bass sound, which you don't associate with how disgusting the record is. Yeah, it's like I said, I was kind of trapped in my narrow minded uh, approach and and I was just seeking things heavy, you know, and and getting more and more of that stuff. And which kind of led to uh, when me and, and John Gallagher started Dying Fetus yeah, yeah. in 1991, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was 91, was it? Right. Yeah, I was going to uh, get that. Trying to, uh, you know, in the following the footsteps of suffocation and, and that sort of thing. So it's been a real joy going back and like and looking yeah. at some of these records that I've, you yeah. know, I'm as I much have a much more open mind about now. And <laughs> yeah, I've I've been doing it all day, like going back and listening to. Those are, but uh, so that that was my one by a pinch. This is my two. Ah, blessed are the sick. Yeah, that's. I think that I would say more of Angel might be my all time favorite death metal band. Yeah, just across, you know, the whole everything. You know, pretty much. You know. Up the gateways, I guess. I yeah, I really, I really like you know, and I'd go to I so consistent, so consistent, so much incredible riffs. Just the catalog is it's mind blowing. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think I mean the last few, notwithstanding, up to formulas. Formulas is an absolutely scorching record. I love that record, but those first few, but. Blessed at the time, I remember standing in the record shop in Dublin and, and Mental Funeral and Blessed Sick came into the shop, I think on the same day. And everyone, you could, didn't have enough money to buy both. So you were trying to weigh up which one to buy. But I remember standing there listening to it in the record shop. And I said to my friend, fucking Thy Kingdom, come, that's from the demo. And my, <laughs> mate, my mate just looked at me and he goes, what are you talking about? It was one of the moments when I realized, you know, when you're a kid, you don't realize I was tape trading a lot at the end of, say, 88, 89, 90. And I thought, I just assumed it was something everybody was doing. I used to go into the record shop and there was one guy in there who would give me some tapes every weekend. But then I realized, oh, everybody wasn't tape trading and didn't know that this was the Thy Kingdom Come demo. 
and just sort of the the things you were doing you realize like oh most people you didn't know all right didn't know this was from this <laughs> and then the um so the whole of side b is obviously demo stuff which is really strange when you think about it i think what it, didn't they mean it to be an ep i think originally the, for side one but i i saw them for that with unleashed in dublin and johnny headland wasn't allowed into the country <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, Anders wasn't allowed into the country, so Johnny had to mm. play the drums and sang. Right, yeah, because he, he was 17 or something? Or? Yeah, he wasn't allowed into Ireland, yeah. That's interesting that I've also heard, maybe I was listening to another podcast or something, but maybe you've heard something about this, was Blessed or the Sick, because of the production, was it somehow instrumental in the backlash from like some of the some of the uh, bands in Norway and Sweden that kind of like they didn't like the production that sort of like I'm not sure I mean a different direction or I'm not sure I mean as a black metal sort of you know halfway house for me I, I always stayed with Morbid Angel because they had the satanic themes and like Covenant yeah. was a record that still resonated very strongly with me at a time when death metal but wasn't as interesting and that's only two years away from this it's 93 I guess yeah. Um, but but the, the production is, the drum sound is much more modern. What you mentioned in your messages before this, um, and I was thinking about this um, the other day, is that it's interesting that Morbid Angel used Tom Morris and not Scott Burns. It seems to have been a sort of uh, quite a wise decision, maybe. Yeah, I mean, some I've found that some people find the production of that record divisive. They find it, you know, kind of processed and thin and say it's like probably the worst they've called it the worst production they had and i didn't, I didn't ever think about it in those terms i no. guess i thought more in terms of riffs then if i like the riffs you know and it sounded heavy then i didn't worry about the details but um I could see what yeah it was um, worse yeah i could see what people mean a little bit about the drum sound being a small bit processed um and maybe being a bit overbearing but i mean the songs are so good you can't really argue with you know, you can't argue with Day of Suffering and the Blessed of the Sick, Fall from Grace. I mean, it's huge sounding, you know, but did that opening of Fall from Grace with the, da, 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 you, and you, the snare yeah. is really on top somehow. Yeah, it's a ripper. Jeez. And this is my, I guess my third of that, if I had top three, was this Dawn of Possession. Yeah, I listened to that today as well. Hadn't listened to it forever. And all of these little flyers that <laughs> I've got stuck to the back of the record. I won't remove or I'll rip it. But yeah, Immolation. I, the thing about Immolation is that, I mean, probably Immolation is for me the consistently over the length of time, um, arguably the greatest death metal band of all time in the, in the sense that they've never made a record I dislike. I mean, maybe Harnessing Ruin is, is an era, a time where I'm not that excited-ish, but the last few, Atonement, absolutely brilliant. They I still really like close to World Below. Yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. That one, that one really, yeah. But the last one is crushing. I think Atonement is is incredible. Yeah, they've they're solid and reliable and great songwriters and legends. Yeah, I mean, and the interesting, the weird thing about it is like it's Harris Jones. That's right. Harris did that. <laughs> I actually tried to, for the book, I tried to talk to him about that. He's, he just didn't really remember much from a lot of these sessions. So he just. I met him you know, once. I met him once. Kind of an old, kind of an old hippie, rocking hippie kind of guy. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. I met him once at, at, um, backstage at something or other. And I wanted to ask him about Voivod and Sodom. And he was just like. More exactly. Like, he was just like, oh, I don't know. He just didn't. I, I was trying to mine him for stories and ask him about stuff. He just wasn't really very interested. Exactly. Yeah, I had the same experience. We sat down for beer. We were playing in Berlin one time and walked across town and had a friend of mine, mutual friend, had us meet. And I was, you know, I was like starry. I, you know, the legend, Harris John, his name's on all the great records, you know, from the 80s, Voivod. Yeah. You know, the old Halloween creator, coroner, just... You know, and I sat down and, you know, I asked him, because, you know, the book was about death metal. So I was kind of trying to mine him for uh, 
some stories about some of the death metal stuff he did and how what he thought about it. You know, notably, I think he he did uh, he did Consuming Impulse. Yeah, Impulse. that's true. And, yeah, and Dawn of Possession. Yeah, and uh, he did a Protector record, I think, later oh, on. Golem, maybe. Uh, Shedding of Skin. I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, nineteen ninety record. Yeah. Yeah, but he he was. Uh, it's the years or, you know, the years have gone by and things, <laughs> other things have come into play. And I'm guilty of that as well. I mean, sometimes it's hard to remember the details. You know, I just, you're at this 30 year mark. But... I, I'm a bit sort of like, maybe it's mild, um, mildly on the spectrum or something like this. But I'm, I mean, I can remember um, probably the price I paid the shop if I thought about it, probably the month um, of, if you pull, take up my reflection and go, um, if you said to me, where did you get this from? Um, Grave seven inch. Um, I would, give me a, a minute or two and I'll be able to go, okay, I got this at a record fair in 19 blah, blah, blah. And I paid this and that and the other. Like I have a kind of um, ridiculously sort of not quite photographic maybe mildly autistic memory for remembering 1988 meaningful, event, meaningful events in one's life so well but I've metal but metal is often defined by such nerdism in a sense like yeah. I, like i've had friends who aren't into rock or metal or anything like this who would you know come down here and they're just like jesus christ i mean i can't turn this to but just all this just covered in records and stuff and they'd be like what the because it's such kind of like obsessive compulsive nerdist behavior and i don't mean that in a patronizing way i mean it like the idea of collecting everything and knowing okay you're 1987 you got this for 295 and all this kind of stuff and a lot of people reference think that is it only metal that has that sort of devoted feeling of uh, being this sort of avid collector of numbers like, because I'm quite obsessed with the num the numbers and the statistics and all this kind of stuff, and how long you've been into something seems very important to metalheads. That maybe it doesn't seem so in other kinds of music. I don't know. Sorry, I've thrown like six different questions at you there. No, I think you're correct. I mean, people who are into metal are very passionate about it. It's without a doubt. It's you know something which which resonates and, you know, we're drawn to and attracts to it, most of us at a very young age and we become lifelong fans. And, and, and it's, it's something we, we take as, as part of our identity and, and, you know, the record collecting of course has been around as long as records. And, and there are those who like different genres and collect records and, but there's something about this, you know, this is something also, I think that goes back to the, what was special about the tape trading stuff and the whole analog culture around it, of tape, about tape trading, the fanzines, the very tangible aspect of the culture and of the metals, the international metal underground, you know, as an imagined community, to use, you know, an academic term, yeah. is, was very bound up in, in that kind of media and the way, you know, because you, know, you just had this idea of what was happening over in, you know, Stockholm or in Tampa or some other place and you just create this whole mythology in your head about it. And, and you know, yeah. when you got a tape, a letter in the mail from someone from those places or a tape, it was very much a very tangible kind of thing that bound it all together. So I think that's kind of like where it all began for me, you know, like just coming home from work back then or and just open up the mailbox and there'd be a oh, stack yeah. of letters from 10 different countries. Yeah, yeah. And just, that just drew me in. It was just, you know, like, it was just the internationalism of it, like, and then... Yeah, it sounds like a cliche, yeah. but it was totally magical, and it sounds like a, a cliche when you tell people now, but coming home and, yeah, you're right, finding the mailbox full with tape trading cassettes and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I just don't know if it could ever be like that again, of course, because of the way communication is now, but to the, that's the kind of... I think that metal in the 1980s and, and up until, like, 91 and... And what we're talking about here was very much wrapped up in that mythology and mystique of it all. And that's kind of what draws you in and gets you hooked. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, we're kind of like, as we grow old, we still feel bound to that in a special way, you know, and we, and we want to collect stuff from that time. And of course, part of it is just like any kind of old nostalgia people have, but, but when you've lived through that time and it's, 
you know, it was such a, you know, a glorious time to quote the late Brian Patterson. It was just, you know, it's, it's something that comes to define your whole life in a way. Yeah. yeah like, you know, as, as it has for us, you know, we went on to play in bands and stuff. And, and when you go on tour and you actually meet those people you used to write letters to, you know, later in life. And it's kind of cool. Yeah, it definitely is. It's like some sort of Masonic, um, you know, kind of structure, heavy metal Mason structure. We show up in, <laughs> in Chile, Brazil, and somebody goes, oh, I used to write to you in 1989, 1990. Like, fucking hell. Okay, yeah. So tell yeah, me, what, what's your... Um, I'm looking at this list here. Sorry for What do you think is the most, uh, what do you think of as an underrated album from this time? Underrated. Um, I mean, about all the, the ones you name, I don't know if there's any that are so underrated, but I, I know ones that, because like, you picked the 90, 1991 year. So mm -hmm. that, I know some that are in and around that, which I always felt were underrated, but I. Yeah, okay, we'll throw them out and I'll tell you what mine is. Oh, will I tell you what mine is? Um, um, mine is uh, Tiamat, The Astral Sleep. Okay, yeah, I never, I never really listened to them. Um, well, again, this is one of my favorites, Seven Inches. Yeah. Tiamat, A Winter Shadow. Tiamat is like one of the- Tr Treblinka, or is that someone else? Yeah, 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 Treblinka before that, yeah, yeah. That's um, one of the most important albums, I guess, for Primordial or something. That it had okay. this dark element that was lifted from a bit from Into the Pandemonium, but um, straddled between black metal and death metal, a bit like Samael at the time and Rodding Christ. But Team at the Astro Sleep, I have written down. I have Sentence, Shadows of the Past, I thought was a great record that didn't get much respect at the time. Yeah, that was on... Uh... Who put that out? I was French, on an French label, Sedex or something, or yeah, some yeah. So that definitely didn't get any distribution in the U.S. Or, or I think the Rotting Ways and Misery demo came out in '91, though. Yeah, and the demo came out the same. So I've tried to disappear to find that seven inch, but that looks a bit weird. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Sentence were a, a fucking great band. The Rotting Ways and Misery, Journey to Poyola. The demo before North From Here uh, blew my mind at the time because they were moving into that sort of Iron Maiden. And I think Sentence don't get the respect for bringing in that twin guitar, a bit of Maiden and stuff. Uh, like the kind of thing that Dissection also ended up doing. Sentence for- well, Certainly by North From Here. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, um, I think it's a brilliant record and it's, it doesn't quite get the respect it deserved for being a kind of proto maiden death metal melodic kind of record and um, but certainly shadow yeah. past i thought was a fucking great record yeah definitely north from here too i came out on spine farm in finland so i don't think that one had distribution widely either but uh i guess they made up for it when they went on to century media and did pretty well yeah i mean there's a whole that whole finnish scene demigod demilich pertinence convulse funebra um yeah there's so much or if you never Swedish no I think they're children yeah, they're from Orphan, Finnish isn't it yeah yeah, yeah abhorrence of course abhorrence just... yeah. it never quite grabbed me as much as the Mara Sound and Stockholm scenes but it's I mean, it's amazing how like a lot of the younger bands today like really fetishize or you know really are drawn to that Finnish town yeah like a lot of younger bands especially Demolik have become so influential yeah, this new wave of underground bands in the U.S. But um, but yeah, as far as I do know, my most disappointing record of the year. Okay, true. This is very, this is very divisive. Give me that. <laughs> I was never one who really liked or bought into clandestine. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I loved Left Hand Path to Death. I think that might be my single. It's definitely my top five all time. Yeah. Um, that to me is like a perfect death metal record. And I've had this kind of debate with people before, but I mean, the, I mean, the clandestine to me is totally killed by the vocals. Yeah. Well, that's Nicky Anderson singing, right? Yeah. It just, uh, it doesn't, you know, it has this kind of, it's this kind of, pro, you know, yell or whatever this, 
yelling or I don't know. Yeah. I don't, it just wasn't for me and it wasn't what I expected. And still to this day, I still have a hard, I, I always go back to it every now and then and trying because the riffs are great. I love the production. Yeah. But I just can't get over that. So that's certainly, that was kind of, I remember back then I was pretty disappointed with that. Hmm. I, I have to admit, I love it, but I do prefer Left Hand Fat, but I love it. But I do know what you mean. I, I was quite surprised at the vocals as well. And then um, I think there was a video for Stranger Eons was on MTV a lot. Yeah. And they said it was the guy from Carnage, Johnny Dordevich or something. Yeah, the bass player, I think. But it didn't, um, but yeah, it wasn't him at all, though, was it? It was Nicky just doing it. And then they just decided to put this dude up front. Yeah, there's so many stories I've heard about who actually, like, I think even even on there's, a, you know, another EP where... Um, but there's, there's the Crawl EP with the guy from Nirvana. To, uh, yeah, and there's the Stranger Eons EP. Yeah. Also has different vocals on it. Maybe he did sing on that then, actually. I haven't listened to that in a long time. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that, was, that, was, that was kind of a letdown. But, you know, as I said earlier, I was kind of gravitating towards the more brutal stuff. And and uh, that was that, unfortunately. But. Well, I mean, I find personally, I you know, despite what you, I'd have to disagree. And I this is like pretty contentious, but I always found necroticism overrated. Like yeah. I, I know that's almost sacrilegious, but... <laughs> Um, there was just something about like, it's, well, maybe not necroticism, but heart work and stuff. I just, I guess at the time, because I was listening to a lot of Merciful Fate, Man of War, a lot of traditional heavy metal, um, something rankled with me that heart work seemed to be an album that death metal fans who didn't understand or like heavy metal anymore listened to. But then I'd be listening to it going, well, you could just listen to heavy metal with the same <laughs> sort of riffs. And there was just something about it that didn't quite, I just didn't quite get. I saw, Car saw Carcass in 92, but Necroticism always for me seemed a little bit, like I like it, but a little bit overrated, but I know that's probably sacrilegious, you know? Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I I liked it. I thought it was okay. I thought it was fun, you know, which probably death metal isn't supposed to be, maybe. <laughs> which Necroticism or Hard Work? Uh, hard Work. Yeah, I liked some parts of it, but I was, you know, I was kind of moving away from that style at that but point. But a lot of people I still like, and I, I just thought it was, it was necroticism in particular. Like as, as I mentioned before, it's like they, you know, they went went into somewhere I never thought they would go, and they just refined everything. And yeah, the riffs were there, and I thought it was, I thought it was killer. I, I think it's one of those records that I undeniably know is good, um, but somehow it just sort of left me a little bit on the shore. Maybe it's because you're young and you're a pain in the arse and because everyone else loved it so much, I had to be the kind of pedantic kid who was just like, no, I prefer. Did you like symphonies? Yeah, ish. But I mean, Grindcore sort of wasn't, uh, I mean, kind of started and ended with World Downfall for me. Yeah. And at the time that whole, like I didn't, I don't like Benediction. Um, I didn't like like the whole Peaceville kind of stuff then uh, Peaceville I liked yeah yeah sure but the whole Napa I know was never I liked Scum and from Enslavement Federation but Symphonies um, I have to admit at the time I was just more into Morbid Angel and evil stuff than <laughs> swampy grindy uh, you know kind of low tuned sort of stuff but it must have had a pretty good huge impact on you though Carcass right yeah, I actually saw them in 1990. I think it was a Symphonies of Sickness tour. Technically, for them, it was in the U.S. opening for Death. Oh yeah, a spiritual healing tour. And I don't. I'd heard them earlier that year. I think the first time I'd actually heard them was like one of those, you know, uh, grind crusher comps or something yeah, that yeah. came out. Your eight comps, and it just it immediately got the record. It was just like I'd never heard anything like it before. Just the it's the black. I, I don't think. I mean, of course, I heard because around the same time I heard Terrorizer, so I was just hearing all this like new ways to use the blast beat and yeah, yeah. You know, pushing the sonic boundaries of what's possible with music, kind of thing. And 
and I was, I was standing right on the side of the stage and watching him, you know, three piece up there. It was in fact when Jeff had the two microphones, I think he had one with a pitch shifter and like yeah. one with a regular or something. And yeah, they just got up there and killed it. And, and then death came on. And uh, that was just a revelation, man. First time I'd seen them. Yeah, the first time I saw death was 92 for human. Um, with Paul Masvidal and um, <clears throat> I think Sean Reinhardt and I'm not sure who was, can't remember who was playing the bass, but uh, yeah, it was human. And uh, they arrived late off the, they missed the ferry across, the most bands would have to come across, across in the ferry to Dublin. And they missed the ferry and there was like, they, there was two, Death were supposed to play two nights and they cancelled the first night. And so everybody, wow. everybody from the first night showed up to the second night with their tickets. And they just load, just like, I guess, over pushed the venue by two, 300 people, 250 people. So it was mayhem inside. And then the band arrived late and Loud Blast were supporting. We're supposed to get Pestilence, they didn't come. Loud Blast came and played four songs and Death played eight songs. And I never forget it during the, like Death, just about two minutes into the first song, this kid jumped off the very high speaker, came straight through the crowd in front of me and put his leg through the floor like straight through the floor, broke his leg, I guess, straight ah. to the floor. They pulled this kid out and then four security guards had to stand with their arms linked in the middle of the pit of an oversold venue of two, 300 people, holding to stop people from going in the hole in the ground, just fucking hitting people. Is that in, in hmm? Is that no, 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 it's in a venue called McGonagall's. McGonagall's, which, yeah, yeah. Which was closed. Oh. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. I have a flyer here. I got this bolt thrower flyer from McGonagall's from back in the day. Oh, yeah. Black and white one with a kind of dude with the, the gum sort of written on it. Yeah. Somewhere around here. Yeah, McGonagall's. Bolt thrower played in McGonagall's in 1988 with Carcass and Electro Hippies on a Saturday mm -hmm. afternoon for like one pound, like a more like a punk rock show. But uh, yeah, and then Death played and they played eight songs. Chuck didn't say anything to the crowd. Um, stared out over the crowd. It was very weird um, for us to see. Like, they didn't look like a death metal band at all. They were brilliant, but like it was really strange stand up. Like they weren't engaging with the crowd at all. And then afterwards, you'd expect a band like that to not come out and talk to people, but they were out. Like Chuck was just standing in the hallway of the venue talking to people. And we were, I, I remember we asked him, I said, Oh, do you like immolation and all this stuff? And he was just like, No, <laughs> no, of course not. And then this girl came up to him and said, uh, why didn't you play a longer set? Blah, 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 blah. And he just took a look at her and he went, bitch, change your tampon. <laughs> and we were kids. We were like, what? If we, we were 16, like, wow, okay. <laughs> that was a bit. Dude. That was a bit weird. Yeah, he, I mean, he was sort of friendly with us, but kind of not friendly. But yeah. Yeah, as you know, like, you never know, like, what goes on. They kind of had a... Anything could happen on that ferry. Anything could happen when you're on st the shitty monitors also, you know, yeah, yeah. like make you feel like smashing your shit and walking off stage, but you just got to go through with it, you know? And Yeah. But yeah, that's weird. No, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I liked Carcass, but I always thought it was a little bit. The, 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 the sort of, maybe it was just the fact that it was just so popular and I was just being cantankerous and I was just like, no, I prefer <laughs> Rotting Christ, Passage to Arturo, or whatever, you know? But I have a few, um, so what was the best show you saw that year? It might have been uh, Cannibal Corpse and Gore Guts. Really? Yeah, we used to have this place in, in Maryland called Wilmer's Park. It was this old, like, uh, kind of run down, like, I don't know, speakeasy kind of bar in the middle of a field in the countryside outside Washington, D.C., it was an old like chitlin circuit bar which was like when the um old r b bands would tour around for for uh, black audiences that would there would be like a special venue for that yeah but then the owner started just like letting any kind of shows happen there and by the late 1980s um he started doing metal shows there and it was infamous because it was a place we can go and drink underage they would serve like you know high school kids there or anybody yeah, so yeah. we can we can just go there to see anybody. I remember I got my first mosh pit there to a band called Wrathchild America. Oh yeah. I remember them. <laughs> well, I the Wrathchild America were the quite different from Wrathchild UK. Yeah, yeah. 
a little bit different, but, uh, and they were like, kind of like our, uh, one of Maryland's contribution to the, you know, late contribution to the thrash kind of thing. But anyways, that was like one of my first shows there with where I actually moshed and fell down and got kicked in the head and all that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it was in January of 1991. It was a tour. The Butcher to Birth tour was launched. It might have been later. I'm not sure. And it was uh, Cannibal Corpse, Atheist, and Gore Guts. Wow. Um, it was the second show of the tour. I know that because I, the night before the tour started in New York, and for whatever reason, Atheist didn't make the show. And it was just Gore Guts, uh, deceased, local band deceased, wow. uh, were local, local to us. Yeah. They opened the show, and uh, Gore Guts played, and, and, and Cannibal Corpse played Butcher to Birth. And just the whole wild I don't know, atmosphere of this place, because like it wasn't police. You could just tell like the, everything was kind of on edge. There was no like, you know, it wasn't like this controlled security guard kind of bullshit you get like in some places these days where, you know, it was just anything goes, no barrier, everything's on stage, like shit's getting kicked over, you know, bottles flying against the wall. And it was just, it was magical <laughs> in all its chaos. And I remember the ceiling was like really low. And when Alex Webster was like doing his head spins, his hair got caught in the ceiling tiles. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like standing there like this, like playing at the same time. But anyways, that, that, that was uh, phenomenal. You know, I got to see Gore Guts for the first time. And I love Consider Dead. That's like another one of my favorites from that year. That's a weird record that kind of didn't register with me at all. It didn't land at all. That I actually, I actually like more now than I did, but that's because I sort of fell in love with Gorguts from the from like the new Gorguts. I like I I love the last few Obscura and Coloured Sands and yeah. uh, Play Days Dust. One of my favourite things from the last couple of years, probably because it somehow sounds like death metal, Death Spell Omega. Yeah, yeah. I love what Gorguts are now, but back then I was just like, Ugh. It, it, I guess. <laughs> I guess and part of me was like gore guts and i just all that kind of thing it's just no i mean it's not yeah. really much different to rotting christ but <laughs> or septic yeah, but the gore and the guts was definitely its own thing and i could see again you know we, we can see again where that kind of divide was happening yeah you know towards the darker side of death metal and the more like uh i don't know <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was looking through some of the, I was trying to find my favorite seven inch of the year, and like that would have been Incantation, um, Unleashed, and The Laughter's Died. Um, this, which is this member, Skin Her Alive, nice. Grave, Yamat, yeah. it's all a bit darker stuff, you know, the, the go, 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 stuff never, it didn't really do it for me. But it must, that must have been your bag then, because then you went on, like you mentioned earlier, to do start the dying fetus then, you know? Yeah, that's, you know, like that we really gravitated towards the New York scene at that time. And the New York scene like, came up into the mid 90s. And that was an interesting time, you know, because death metal was, uh, you know, it went back underground again for the most part. By 1995, I remember going to see Malevolent Creation in Baltimore. They had forbidden opening up for them. Oh, that's weird. And there was like 10 people there. You know, nobody cared. It yeah. was just, it was back under underground. And that's when bands started pushing the, the boundaries in other ways. And that, but um, yeah, I mean, it was interesting because I've often had this kind of like, uh, you know, theory about how, you know, death metal kind of emerged in the late, in the context of the late 1980s. Mm. You know, this kind of like, you know, the, it came out of naturally out of punk and metal sort of in, a, in a way. And at the time, you know, it's like Cold War, it's like 80s excess. It's like Reaganism, Thatcherism. Yeah. You know, it just, it just seemed like it kind of cult culminated in this kind of like late 80s, like explosion of like, you know, what it was heading towards all along. Yeah. In a sense. But then if you if you take this broader kind of like weird like this is this weird kind of economic theory I have about it. Okay. Like when when times are like that and you have those kind of tense moments in culture, that's when transgressive music kind of pushes the boundaries and starts expanding and like thriving in a way. So that after the Cold War and 
in the United States, you know, you got Bill Clinton coming in and, and there's this new kind of era of a new cultural, you know, structure of feeling, if you will, mm -hmm. which kind of, you know, it's, it push, it, it has an effect on culture in the sense that maybe the, the, the expression for death metal, like you said, even in, in, in Ireland is kind of like new culture of like ecstasy culture came about and, it, and the U.S. grunge came about and all this other stuff where like extreme music felt like it maybe it reached its, it's uh, it reached this kind of like a uh, pinnacle or threshold or whatever, where it, it did what it, it could. And then it went off and fragmented into all these sub genres, you know, yeah. death to black death and atmospheric and all these other things were being tried. And I think you have it went, a back, point. It went back underground again for the, for the nineties. So. I think you have a point. I, I, I have to, I think about, about it. I've thought about that kind of quite a lot, but what I think is maybe that um, po post-1990, you have the fall of the Berlin Wall and you have a kind of shifting in the axis of the power structures of the West. And I think that there was an economic sort of revival in the early 90s. So you have the birth of this new emergent middle class. And so I, I think that the music that they liked and that reflected uh, in their tastes. I mean, if you look at the biggest heavy metal bands in the end of the 90s, early 2000s, it's all symphonic, gothic, female-fronted, slushy sort of stuff with no teeth or claws compared to 1986, which was right. still music metal. Okay, you have your Dio's and your priests, but bands who are quite aggressive sort of speak to a, an aggressive time. And I think by 96, maybe that, that society has changed. Certainly in Ireland, Ireland was rough as guts in the 80s, but by 96, it was in the middle of an economic revival and society changed. I mean, everything from the violence on the streets to people's yeah, attitudes. Really was, yeah. the, birth of, the birth of this new emergent middle class definitely altered our relationship, I think, to aggressive music. Um, exactly. And that's maybe where you get your Dimmu Borgirs and your also this other kind of stuff maybe becomes popular at the end of the 90s because it's no longer the preserve of, I don't know, 300 angry young men in a venue beating the shit out of each other to, 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 to you know exactly definitely, yeah. definitely that 87 86 88 thrash is about as aggressive as it can possibly get um still yeah, probably persecution mania <laughs> yeah pleasure to kill yeah all that kind of stuff because it, i mean living on the essen in 86 in the rural industrial area of germany was no you know it was no economic miracle either and i think that that was a lot of places and I suppose it's reflected in the music so I think there's something in your theory definitely the the emergent middle class has some part of how their listening tastes changed and I think it is metal went underground uh, quite a, quite considerably yeah and it's the broad the disappearance of the nuclear threat to you know temporarily it wasn't as such it wasn't as you know stark as it was in the 80s yeah and if you follow that trajectory you know by the time you get up to the you know 2000 and then 9-11 and this war on terror and there's mm. this kind of new tension in american culture mm. where metal all of a sudden is thriving again yeah you no know, and i don't know it's just something i've always kind of wondered about about why there was that kind of you know that it's fizzling out of of, the, of death metal it reached that apex or whatever and then it yeah. kind of like plateaued but then there but then, the, but then it kind of came back around the early 2000s. I mean, the success of bands like Nile, Cryptopsy in the USA, they were selling 20, 30, 40,000 units probably in the USA. At least I heard in the early to mid 2000s. And then it almost entirely collapsed. By well, the thing, was, the thing was like with new metal, I think that provided a gateway for people to get into more heavier stuff. From that, it went to Slipknot to, to other more extreme bands, you know, and, and that's when there was that kind of resurgence. But in the same time, it kind of mainstreamized it. So now people in, in mass culture know what death metal is. They may not listen to it, but they know death metal and there are death metal bands and you know there's references, cultural references for it. So that creates a kind of new, like it kind of blurs the lines between, you know, underground death metal and mainstream death metal. <laughs> what is mainstream anymore and what isn't? Because they're, they're all, you know, but on the same you know platform. You know what I mean? Like there was a moment around 2004, 2005, where anecdotally I heard that, you know, like a lot of those bands were touring the States and doing really good numbers. 
But now, it's the last three or four or five years, if you sent out Cryptopsy on tour or something, that sort of bubble had long, long since burst. I don't know about that, but I've certainly heard anecdotally some horror shows from people I know who went over and toured the US in the last couple of years, Vader and stuff about, you know. Yeah, it goes in waves, you know. It's, you know, these are the ebbs and flows of culture and and how they, you know, the economy as well it hasn't been that great. So, yes, I suppose so. <laughs> that, yeah. of course, dictates a lot of it. But, uh, and then there's the new questions about what's going to happen with it now with the yeah, touring yeah. industry. But wait, that's that's for another podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what uh, I have a, a few more things here, like, but um, is there an album? Okay, it's, let's say three questions, right? An album, yep. that's, an album that's aged badly, an album that you didn't rate at the time that you do now, and maybe the most surprising album of the time, or something like this. You know, I've got a, they can sort of be wrapped up into the same question. Like, for my, for my didn't rate, oddly enough, I have Soul Side Journey, which didn't, for some reason, I didn't like at the time, but I like a lot now. Dis- yeah, same here. Um, yeah. The most surprising that blew my mind was Paradise Lost Gothic. That I suppose can still be termed death metal on some grounds, but yeah. Gothic just was, I mean, in Ireland, we really resonated with the miserabilism of My mm. Bride. So My Dying Bride, maybe we're doing Symphonaire around the time. My Dying Bride, all that doom, death. Yeah. Paradise Lost Gothic was just, and for me, Gothic is one of the most influential Re- metal records of all time top 20 30 of all time it just to take the sisters of mercy sort of weird mix it with death metal and the harmony slow lead over it has to be the most surprising along with well the astral sleep which i mentioned before mm. but, uh, i don't know what do you think of that um well i i, I remember listening to yeah, I, it was like they they did this like a video some videos for one of those songs back then or something and i, I saw it and and a friend of mine bought Gothic and it was cool, but it didn't, it didn't really grab me. It didn't resonate, you know, for previously noted reasons. It was kind of like, that wasn't where my mind was, but I definitely appreciate it now. Can you get into like serenades or let's say Crestfallen, Anathema, Serenades, Symphonaire, My Dime. All that stuff I just got, just heard recently because I, it just, it was like part of that, like, avant-garde kind of atmospheric stuff which i didn't totally get into back then i was yeah. hungry for something with teeth you know yeah i don't know maybe it's living in finland the last three years but i've really <laughs> gravitated towards that yeah that anathema the old my dying bride stuff you know it's yeah, yeah. i've really gone back to that and as the flower and, as the flower withers is a massive record those first two turn loose the swans the symphonary p as a flower withers are me. massive yeah, very gloomy, very dark. And there was there was not just those three bands, there was a whole host of all sorts of other um, old, um, I guess, n- North of England doom death bands that were around at the time who were um, very big here and a very big impact. I think it's a form of, I think it's a form of miserabilism and bitterness that we shared with all those kind of bands. Because most of the Irish bands had that gloom about them as well. Yeah, I could, I could totally see it. I, I appreciate it now, and I wish I appreciated the diversity of it all back then. I mean, I, I did in a way, but I didn't. <clears throat> I just, I just didn't give it the time I should have, I guess. Um, and I found other records too from um, that that year or two. I think, I think the Punch and Stench. Oh yeah. Didn't come, didn't come out then. That's another one I've kind of like picked up on lately. Is is like really cool and and transgressive in its own way, which I kind of missed out on then in my narrow mindedness yeah. and yeah I'm 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 I i was not that much into that record. I, I had the split with the Mar- Disharmonic Orchestra, I think. Um and I think Disharmonic Orchestra, that album they made where they were all on the back with fluffy toys. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that's not metal. <laughs> it made me actually want to smash their records with a fucking hammer. I hated it. Yeah. Uh, my black metal soul was <laughs> hurt. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I can't have it. But unfortunately, I think Punch and Stench got like pushed into that 
meant by me. Yeah. You probably don't belong there. But for God yourself for me or flesh was kind of cool. Yeah, and as far as the um the one that hasn't held up, I would think what I've listened to lately and it kind of surprised me, even though it's technically proficient, it has some killer riffs and I liked it a lot then, is Testimony of the Ancients. Yeah, that's you know, that's weird. I have that. I have that uh, like in my scribblings here, um, my mess of words. Um, <laughs> the rec record that didn't hold up, Testament of the Ancients. Yeah, doesn't make sense, does it? The silly intros and the. No, it's like, what is all that about? Just take them all out. It's like, I don't know if you ever heard that resurrection record with the, the little, <laughs> with the troll speaking between every song, whatever. Oh, uh, Florida <laughs> Resurrection. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that kind of the, you know, the taking the intro idea of the intro to like a new level to like link all the songs. And some of the intros are cool. Then there's some of these like weird, like orgy noises in one. And there's another one, which is like a little avant-garde keyboard thing. And then, yeah. <clears throat> but as a whole, like I used to love that record back then. And um, today, like put it side by side with Consuming Impulse. And it's like a question. And I even yeah. prefer Malleus Maleficarum personally. Yeah, and I, I know a lot of people who do like that's, that's sharp. yeah the black metal kids prefer malleus it's just yeah. the razor sharp riffing you know but yeah the testimony also you miss martin's voice one of the top yeah. top five top ten death metal vocals of all time gotta be martin and you miss his horrendous vocals and consuming impulse are just part yeah. of the tone you know he made up for it though because another one of my top five or top ten I, I, it might be is his last one on earth by his fix oh yeah that is just a tank. It's a crusher, yeah. yeah. Bismarck and really Booker and Yeah, yeah. It's Sounds like he, he's literally well, I mean, dying. Well, I mean, the rack is 91 as well. Yeah. I like that too. But for some reason, last one on earth, they kicked it up a notch. It's a little more driving. And the new one is cool as well. Still, still at it. But I agree with you. I have I have here albums that aged with difficulty for me um i used to love it and it doesn't make sense that i loved it is unquestionable presence by atheist i because i loved the ravage demo and then i loved the on they slay or whatever it was then i loved peace of time and i tr I, I at the time i i did a fanzine in 1990 and you my review of it is like 95 out of 100 <laughs> presence. but i tried to listen to it today and i found it fucking hard um that and cynic with the weird vocal harmonizer thing it's just I can't do it. Yeah, it's um, it's. I think it to the. I mean, as far as from a production production standpoint, that's like one of the the best sounding, like, records. If if, if you know, if good tight clean production is your thing, that was a phenomenal production job. Mm. Like as far as the everything was just you know pushing and pummeling and. But what doesn't? Yeah, the for me the vocals on that record just kind of like fill space. You know, I mean, the music's cool, the, I mean, the, the tech is there, and there's some really cool, but sometimes it just goes, it gets a little too, it gets a little too uh, twangy and goofy in spots with these like little doo -doo 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 kind of stuff. And yeah, and the vocals have lost that kind of, uh, you know, they're extreme vocals, but they don't sound pissed. They don't, they don't have this kind of like, I don't know, something, yeah. something about them just doesn't speak to me about my life. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'd say, you know, I'd, I I have the same kind of thing. Pestilence, Atheist, Cynic, there's something about them that sort of left me on the shore. I have I have down here demo 7-inch, 12-inch, but you know what, that's that's opening up a, a huge uh, <laughs> morass of, not, of, of tons and tons of names. But I can say without a doubt that the 12-inch thing, like you've got Crawl, you've got Fiend for Blood, You've got so many, you've got so many good fucking 12 inches that time. But Soul Side Journey is a weird one because it didn't speak to me much at the time. I remember being in the record store um, and Soul Side Journey in, in my hand and the Ten Commandments by Malevolent Creation in the other hand. And everything about Soul Side Journey is what I should have gravitated towards, the cover, the logo, the everything. And I listened to it and I just put on multiple stab wounds by Malevolent. And I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm going for Malevolent. Yeah. Which is a classic. Yeah, I, it's I, yeah, I love the first two malevolent or, or stone. Like I love retribution probably even more. Really? That was, yeah, that's just like that was right up my alley at the time. 
the whole the combination of Rob Barrett on guitar and Alex Marquez on drums. For oh, yeah, Sol of course, yeah. Solstice, if you know Solstice from Florida. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, their first record, just like the grooves, uh, everything about it was just like so tight. And and um, as far as like a uh, Soul Side Journey, that's a weird, I got a weird feeling from that. I bought it when it came out and I listened to it a few times and I just didn't understand it maybe. Mm. I don't know. I just got a vibe from it. It's a very but, cold record. It's very dark, very cold. There's I didn't some... know what it was. Yeah. Like, I was like, this sounds like it's sunlight. It sounds like it should be a death metal record, but maybe they were trying to figure out what they, obviously they were trying to figure out what they wanted to be because the next record was, you know, but I just, it, it didn't, you know, but go, now when I put on Cromlech, I'm like, yes, you know, dude, <laughs> you know, like, but back then it just went over my head or under my head or whatever. I don't know. But and what did you feel? Are you? I, I, I mean, most people wouldn't even consider this a contest, but I would. Um, I, I would put where no life dwells up against, um, like an ever flowing stream. In what way? Just I, like I, I, most, I think a lot of people would prefer dismember, but I, I'm a big unleashed fan, old unleashed, and so there's something about where no life dwells and the dark one, and then the laughter has died, and where life, yeah. Dark the aura that has an aura that record, which I, I, you know, of course, for the creation time is, is like, and but that actually, now that I think about it, that almost has the kind of autopsy kind of production, yeah, yeah. But it, it's, so. it's Valdemar, isn't it? Valdemar Sorcha, um, he did a lot of the early century media, early 90s stuff, Valdemar, right? Or is it is where low life dwells isn't sunlight because I remember that was a big thing at the time they didn't go to sunlight to do it. It's like Woodhouse, or something Woodhouse or? Studios in Berlin, yeah. And Voldemar Socha was the guitar player of the band Despair. Do you remember them? Thrash band, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had some cool albums. Uh, I think that one of the guys from, from Century Media was actually in Despair as well. But they had Beyond All Reason it was quite a cool album. Um, hmm. And Voldemar, he did The Astral Sleep. He did Morgoth Cursed. He did Where No Life Dwells. Um, he did a, he did of course amazing jobs on Ceremony of Opposites, a male a few years later, Rodding oh, Christ. Man. Yeah, he did some huge productions, but When All Life Dwells has a thing that isn't, that's very different to 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 the thing, you know, that stuff going on. So I, mean, I think it's a very dark record. Yeah, definitely I think Unleashed and Graves stood out because they they didn't go to sunlight, right? Oh yeah, Grave went somewhere else. Um we're quite where I can't I should have had the record here. But I mean, you can see even on the back of the, you know, on the Grave 7 inch, they, I think they, Century Media were signing these bands and then sending them to um, a studio in Germany, bringing them over to do like uh, one day sessions. Like that, they went to this is right. Bellefield in Germany. Um, same with uh, Tiamat, same with some of those bands that they were, I suppose, primed, groomed, I don't know. <laughs> came to record a seven inch in Germany before the main record. But there's something about that, those records that, especially Into the Grave also has a very dark sort of tone. Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm a big fan of You'll Never See. That's the yeah. one that really, where I think is their magnum opus, I guess, if you want to call it that. But, but it's quite interesting that, that it's quite interesting that those bands already had decided to steer a bit clear of each other whereas the florida bands were all going to morrison yeah it was interesting when i talked to, to ola about the recording of that they wrote you'll never see in the hotel room like after a tour before they had to go in the studio yeah <laughs> yeah just like really fast you know like just threw it all together and went and recorded a record and they just come up with that it's like, wow still making good records though I mean, you know, both those bands have opened the ups and downs now, but I, st I mean, I still buy the new Incantation album and I still check out what Unleashed and all these bands are doing, especially Immolation and stuff. I mean, they can yeah. get a second lease of life, but they seem to all hit a kind of fallow period at the end of the 90s, early 2000s and come back up. Yeah, long I mean, it's amazing how, I mean, I never would have thought 30 years later, like we're still talking about the bands that put out albums through all these years and it's just... You know, and, and, the, and the consistency, it's still been good. And, and I think, you know, I think the scene is pretty healthy. You know, the, I think you, you asked before about if, you know, if, is the best metal in the underground now or in the mainstream? Or, yeah. You know, I think it is 
it's a little bit of both. There's just so much. I mean, there's like a thousand bands on Bandcamp. There's like so much, you know, being metal being made of all kinds and so much great death metal. And I'm yeah. constantly hearing, you know, there's, there's like a new tape label starting every week with like, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's so much stuff. I find it hard to keep up with. I mean, even when I, I used to live in the same house as Dara from Invictus. And before he had his own offices, you know, all the stuff would be coming into this spare room and you just go in and just, I just go in and stare at the one and go, fucking, okay, here's 25 CDs that I'm just going to check out to see. But now it's, if I could, I still have 20 records, 25 records every year that I really quite like. When I'm asked to do my top 20 at the end of every year, I can do it. I, I know a lot of people struggle, older, you know, uh, people who are struggle to reconnect with some of the newer bands in the scene. But you're right, there is just so many bands, so many things. <laughs> It's and a lot of it's really good too. Yeah. So it's, it's just so hard to keep up and like and and like find the hours of the day to listen to all this stuff. And I yeah. guess you know we're not teenagers anymore, but yeah. So you've started a shop up there. You might we might as well um, bookend this thing with that. You started a shop up there. How easy was that to do? Or it's mainly a death grind shop. Yeah, when I got here about three years ago, um, you know I. As I mentioned earlier, there was this kind of niche open here, maybe. You know, Finland is a very metal country. Helsinki's a, a very metal city. And I noticed, you know, there's a there's a black metal shop here. Yeah. It's pretty dedicated, which is pretty much black metal dedicated cult. Yeah, yeah, by Sami from Die Serpent. Yeah. Yep. And um and I was talking to my buddy Petri. You know, we always, you know, as we we're talking before, we're record nerds and we love the music and it's a good excuse to uh to be around the music all the time and we saw an opportunity to well there's if there's there isn't one of these kind of stores here for death metal and extreme you know grindcore and hardcore punk and that kind of stuff then we should try and uh and set one up and about uh yeah about so we started out as kind of an underground thing for like a year or two you know like a like in this dungeon cellar in this building where it was like an appointment only kind of thing oh Appointment only. Yeah, <laughs> on Saturdays, you know, we'd be down there and come down and get some coffee and look at the records. So now, since the pandemic hit, you know, some of us had a little more free time. So yeah, we tell, uh, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's some uh, there's some open storefront spaces too. So we took a chance and we uh, got a storefront here at Helsinki Katu, 32 in the Kalio district of Helsinki. Oh yeah. Take a little look at it real quick. Oh yeah, yeah, do. It. And there's the records. We got shirts, everything. And uh, it's been going good. Yeah. People uh, really like it, and really appreciate it, and we have an online component as well. So it's That's steady. Cool. That's cool. Right. So before we go, what is then your favorite death metal album of all time? Of all time. For all did. If you had to pick um, one. <laughs> I would probably say, I mean, uh, <sighs> Harmony Corruption, Napalm Death. <laughs> considered a, that's considered a death metal record. Did you, <laughs> face one, you said, huh? <laughs> I made a face when you said that. <laughs> that's the one I always kind of, that's the one that's like, a, it, it just always, it's like going home every time I hear it. Wow. You know. I bought that record. I bought I bought that record the day it came out and I sold it about a week later. In Ireland. Yeah, yeah in Ireland we used to do this thing when you have never had any money for drink or for whatever. But there was such a there was huge racks of secondhand records. And it was brilliant at the time in the late eighties, early nineties, because like metal from eighty three, eighty four was 85 was so unpopular by 1990 that you could just skip find like tons of venom and all the stuff that we were you know, <laughs> kind of stuff that was out yeah. the door but napalm i i loved scum i loved from enslavement i loved them um, uh mentally murdered and then when harmony corruption came out it was really on the wrong side of the fence where death metal was concerned for me and i just yeah i fucking i i wanted studs and nails and satan and it <laughs> Just. what's co-equal i mean that's that's the one i always like but i mean still i think i could put it on the same i could put it on the same pedestal as consuming impulse you know war master bolt thrower uh 
retribution, malevolent creation. Those are kind of like my, you know, my, the ones that kind of, I always think about very fondly. Well, I uh, have to, I mean, I'd have to put Ultras of Madness. I mean. That too. You see, I, I mean, there's just so many. I think I keep forgetting about them. Yeah, Ultras of Madness, Covenant. I mean. What about, um, I have to put, I mean, I, I mean, I would say Possess Seven Churches as well. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm think I might be in the camp that doesn't count that as a death metal record. But it do, yeah, but it has a song called Death Metal on it. It does. So did <laughs> Onslaught, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. We have a no. No, was was it, it was uh, was it Onslaught or was it? No, yeah. yeah. So Onslaught has a song on Power from Hell called Death Metal. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought. Yeah, yeah. Let's. That's it. Could very well be. I mean, that to me. To me, I think dark, dark, uh, dark angel, darkness ascends is almost yeah, almost proto, yeah. proto, proto death metal. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, when the divisions were only minute, but yeah, dark angel, darkness ascends is proto. I think it could be considered proto death metal easily. Yeah. Black thrash, even and probably what it would have been considered at some stage. Quite whatever that fucking means, I don't know. Well, harmony corruption. Yeah, all right. <laughs> There's a drug. Well, I mean, among many, I, I would put it on the same pedal. It was just the first thing that popped in my yeah, head. No, it's yeah. good. It's good because it's like it's my my face was. <laughs> it's the it's um, but that's the thing about this period though that there's so many great records. I mean, how like, about you? What was yours? My well, my of all time was Alters and Madness. Which push, push came to shove with Alters and Madness, but it's also could be Left Hand Path. Mental funeral, seven churches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Left hand path, of course. Seven churches. Um, there's just, there's just so, and even the records that I would have considered like first, second division are still eight out of ten records. You yeah. know, I mean, just looking at the list is insane. Even something like Morgoth Cursed, which you know is a lot. It's kind of like death, the German death. Yeah, yeah. there's a record. Not bad, not bad at all. If it came out now, people would be all over it, you know. But sarcophago, the laws of scourge is ninety one. Mm. I mean, not it doesn't hold a candle to iron iron or I, but if I don't know, is that death metal sarcophago iron or I? If so, is, that's gotta be rise. A, is a rise death metal? I don't know. Um, it's sort of, sort of not. Sort of, yeah, exactly. It's just it's such on the line. It could be a thrash record just as easily. Yeah. To me. All right. Well, sir, let me press the press the button. <laughs>